Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, or good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, I think we are we are good to go here. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Golan Levin, and I'm a professor of art and director of the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, uh, the U Carnegie Mellon's uh, College of Fine Arts Laboratory for Atypical um, Antidisciplinary and Interinstitutional Research and Outreach at the Intersection of Art, Science, Technology, and Culture. Um, so uh, our laboratory is the uh, Arts Research Laboratory of our, of our College of Fine Arts, and we um, have a variety of uh, creative public events, and we are uh, really privileged to be able to host the Steiner Lecture Series in Creative Inquiry. Um, and we are moving it online. Uh, in light of the COVID pandemic. And it is our terrific pleasure to introduce you this evening to our first online Steiner lecture uh, hosted uh, by myself and um, at the studio and featuring uh, Tiga Brain and Sam Levine. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly read uh, their sort of statement and their brief bios, and then we'll get right to uh, their, their talk. Um, uh, in Krishkanovsky's short story, Quadraturin, a cramped apartment dweller applies a magical bomb to the walls of his apartment that expands his home until it becomes infinitely large. <clears throat> the internet, which serves as an enlarging bomb for our lives in cramped isolation, equally threatens to create a space so large that we are lost forever in its midst. Tika Brain and Sam Levine will discuss their collaborative practice, which explores how it feels to live among online interfaces. They will share recent work dealing with commodity, data collection, and the internet as a contradictory space where practices of surveillance and exploitation sit alongside archives of radical generosity, care, and solidarity. Tika Brain is an Australian-born artist and environmental engineer whose work examines how technology shapes ecological relations. She has created wireless networks that respond to natural phenomena, systems for obfuscating fitness data, and an online smell-based dating service. Her work has been shown in the Vienna Biennale for Change, the Guangzhou Biennial, Triennial, and in venues like the Haus der Kultur in der Welt in Berlin and the New Museum in New York City, among others. Sam Levine is an artist and educator whose work deals with data, surveillance, cops, natural language processing, and automation. His work often takes the form of online interventions that surface the frequently opaque political and economic conditions that shape computational technologies. He has exhibited work at Lincoln Center, SFMOMA, Pioneer Works, DIS, Ars Electronica, the New Museum, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and his work has been covered widely in the press. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to an artist lecture by Sam Levine Antigua Brain. Hello. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, so welcome to our exclusive isolation cell. Um, uh, thank, thank you for the introduction, Golan. That's really, was really, uh, we're just are so happy that this is happening and to be here with you all. And I'm looking also at the YouTube chat and it looks like lots of friends are here. So hi. Yes. Hi everyone. Hello to all of our friends. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna we're gonna I think try to keep it relatively in, informal. Uh, we do have like slides that we're gonna go through, but uh, hopefully we're not gonna be reading too much off of the slides. Um, as Golan mentioned, this talk is really inspired by um, a, a very strange short story uh, called Quad Quadraturin. Maybe that's how you pronounce it uh, by an author whose name is extremely difficult for me to pronounce. Um, I think it might be Sigismund Krzyzynowski, right? So, uh, you know, in this story, uh, again, as Golan mentioned, it's like, you know, this, this sort of young apartment dweller lives in the super cramped apartment. He's given a magical balm and told that if he rubs this kind of like weird embiggening cream uh, on the walls of his apartment, uh, that the tiny living space will become larger. So he does it. Um, and the apartment does in fact become like much larger, but he uses too much. And then the apartment grows so large that he's just uh, trapped forever in the middle um, because uh, the exits are now infinitely far away. Right? Um, so we're, we're sort of imagining this story uh, as a metaphor for the internet in some sense, right? Uh, and just like in the, this kind of early uh, heady days of the internet, uh, the tenant is kind of initially excited to have this vast new space to occupy and fill. Um, but as the walls expand rapidly beyond uh, beyond his control, 
that excitement transforms into dread. Uh, so we're sort of looking at our work here as an attempt to maybe toss you a candle or help provide some kind of guidance around um, these vast new spaces and hopefully to regard them as areas of, uh, of potential uh, with potentially treasures uh, hidden in plain sight. Uh, so our talk is called uh, This Archive Should Not Exist. And in it, we're going to cover a series of collaborations that we have done together over the last few years. Um, and these works, in these works, we're particularly interested in the question of what is and isn't allowed to become a commodity. So what is allowed to become privatized? What's allowed to be bought, accumulated, sold for a return? And all of the projects we're going to talk through tonight are very much grounded in the context of North America and respond to the various efforts that have been made here to commodify all aspects of lives, of our lives. So this is from, you know, the electrical grid to the places we live in to our healthcare system. And we try to trace these efforts and their effects through words, images, videos, and the records of our daily experience that yeah, accumulate endlessly uh, on the internet. And so much of the work that we're going to present is, is online work. Um, so these, these endeavors to privatize, uh, crystallize and produce archives, archives of how energy, media, housing and healthcare are bought and sold rather than being e evenly distributed or universally accessible. Um, and so all of the archives today that we're gonna deal with are archives that should not exist. Next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we're gonna go, I guess, in chronological order, talking about four projects. Um, uh, the first project that we like to show usually when we give a talk together is uh, this project called The Good Life, which is about email, machine learning, and um, the Enron Corporation. Uh, and this doesn't involve an archive that we ourselves created, uh, which the other projects do, but an archive that I suppose we took and transformed into an interactive experience. So Enron, as I'm sure everyone, maybe everyone remembers, uh, an enormously successful energy company that was based in Houston. Uh, in 2001, they went bankrupt uh, after revelations of massive uh, corruption and fraud. Uh, and then they were subsequently investigated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or the FERC. Um, and then a very uh, odd decision, I think at the time, uh, the FERC decided to take a good deal of Enron data and make it public. Uh, this data included a huge uh, archive of emails that had uh, been sent between uh, executives at Enron. This is known as the Enron email data set or the Enron email archive. Uh, it originally contained 1.6 million emails. All of these were publicly available. Uh, and it was really the first, um, the first release of an email database of its size. So it actually continues to be uh, one of the only large public domain email collections that's easily and freely available today. Uh, so in our project, The Good Life, you can receive a slightly reduced version of the NRN archive, uh, 225,000 emails in total. And you can get these direct to your inbox over the course of seven, 14, um, or 28 years. These emails come to you in the order they were originally sent and with the appropriate amount of time between each message uh, spaced out uh, relative to their actual original timeline. Um, and we'll just read a few of, of the emails that you might that you might receive. Um, do you want to read this one? Okay. This one, subject line W2 uh, from Peter F. Miss Gonzalez, for some reason I received your W2 in the mail yesterday. I'm located at one a uh, 3148C. Call me and I will arrange to get it to you from Peter Kirby. So like nauseatingly boring office uh, goings on. Uh, this one, slightly more interesting. Uh, judge Scott Link campaign is the subject. Uh, content is, this is our judge in the Beeson case. I don't like him as a judge, but I would recommend that we give him 500 to $1,000. Uh, and this 
given that this was the early days of the internet, uh, perhaps there's lessons in this archive of maybe like what not to send on your work email accounts, such as emails like this one. I'm not going to read it because it's heartbreaking, but Lisa and Gerald are a couple that are getting divorced throughout the archive and their story sort of unfolds with the, with the demise of Enron as well. Um, and so, you know, I think we've all sent these emails full of regret and heartbreak and, and rereading them, I sort of am reminded of these moments that I think we've, we've all had at some time or another. <laughs> this is my favorite email in the Enron archive, I think. Um, it happens sort of towards the end as things are really falling apart. I'm just gonna, I will read the whole thing. It <laughs> says, uh, I really love you. I can't wait to be with you this weekend. I bet you are glad you listened to me and did not buy any Enron stock at $21 considering it is at $18 today. Love you, Tracy. Tracy. As I think it just, it just combines like everything that I love about the Enron archive, which is like, uh, like just knowing way too much personal information about the participants, um, and they're like, kind of like, you know, who is sleeping with who and, and then just like watching this total, uh, economic catastrophe happen at the same time. Um, so, uh, Finn Brunton, who is an expert on spam, uh, and consulted with us on this project, he wrote this about the Enron archive. The FERC had thus unintentionally produced a remarkable object the public and private mailing activities of 158 people in the upper echelons of a major corporation, frozen in place like the ruins of Pompeii for future researchers. So by signing up for The Good Life, you get to experience this firsthand reenactment of the collapse of a massive corporation. Um, your email becomes infected with reminders to go to meetings that happened 20 years ago uh, with all these weird love letters and with like uh, bad jokes from the 90s and of course, with hints of financial fraud. Uh, but there's another reason that I think the project is exciting and the archive is exciting um, and, and, and really worth exploring. Um, and, that, uh, and that is that this Enron archive was initially assumed to be a really good data set about the English language. Uh, so computer scientists thought that it was representative in general of how people communicate. Uh, and of course, the, the archive isn't representative of a general population. It represents mostly white, mostly male, uh, mostly corporate criminals. Uh, and yet, despite that limitation, it's been used as a backbone for countless systems, uh, countless systems that, that we still use to this day, including the very first version of Siri. So by signing up, you get to see you know, how the sausage is made, right? Uh, the raw data behind all these systems that invisibly lurk in our lives. Um, and what's, I think, even more interesting to think about is that today companies um, like Facebook and Google and Twitter, um, they now all have much larger data sets of all of our online activity. So in this interesting way, like all of us now kind of act in the role of Enron employees. Um, our emails, our clicks, our likes, they're all collected, they're all processed, they're all used to train machine learning systems, and ultimately they're transformed into data commodities by private companies. Data. Information. 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 Data. Information. 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 Data. Data. Information. Data. 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 Information. Data. Information. 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 Data. Information. 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 Data. Data. Information. Information. Okay. I'm going to stop that there because it, it goes on, but... Um, so following the, the good life, uh, Sam and I became increasingly interested in uh, the politics of data collection, uh, who is collecting it, how is it, how is it being used, um, and how uh, does this experience of living amongst interfaces and amongst platforms that are collecting data from us all the time, how does this feel? Um, you know, the story of Enron is really prescient. Uh, as most of what we call artificial intelligence today are systems of machine learning. And so, you know, I think it's sort of well established now that these systems, you know, take data from the past to make predictions of what we might do in the future. 
rules are created from patterns in these data sets that then are used to make predictions of what we might buy, if we're likely to re-offend after committing a crime, what messaging might encourage us to vote or not to vote and so forth. Um, sometimes these systems don't work, of course, and sometimes they do. And when they do work, particularly when they work by showing us targeted ads or particular content that's customized for us, one gets this eerie feeling that something's happening that um, you don't quite understand. And that's really where this next Data, project began, uh, which is called The New Organs, and it was commissioned by Mozilla. And, it, and we really wanted to sort of um, capture this feeling of, of not knowing or not being able to explain these things that are happening to you every day. Um, it seemed like every single person has an anecdote about, you know, the internet maybe is listening to me. Maybe you just had a conversation, you were chatting about how, I don't know, you, you love Labradoodles or maybe you need a new graphics card or you want to go on holidays to Japan and then, you know, the very next time you go onto Instagram, there's an ad for that thing that you discussed, even though you didn't type it into the internet. So, you know, Facebook constantly denies that they're using the microphone. It says this in their terms of service. And yet this sort of um, myth or this explanation persists that our devices are listening to us to show us content. And so the project consists of two parts. Um, firstly, we set out to collect stories of people's experiences like this, a predictive system. We were really interested in um, what was happening um, to, to people out there and how were they were feeling about it and sort of what the explanations were that they had for what was happening on algorithmic platforms. So we created this online survey, a very simple survey, just asking, you know, what type of experiences have you had? Um, I really love the checkbox that's just sort of cut off on the screen there, but one of the options is um, I see ads for things I dream about, which, you know, does happen. <laughs> um, and then we took this survey and we uh, used targeted advertising to, to share it online uh, to elicit replies, so used Facebook and various other platforms. And we received about a thousand replies, you know, and stories really ran the gamut. Uh, people recounted how you know, they bought something on Amazon and then continually saw ads for the thing. They clicked on something on Instagram and they saw these ads. So just describing the way that these platforms actually, you know, they work. Uh, and through to, you know, we, of course, people were sharing full blown ex conspiracy theories that they had developed around, you know, uh, um, content that they were seeing. There were stories about uh, people being able to figure out like complex health um, conditions that doctors hadn't been able to diagnose. But then, you know, through their searches happening on Google, they were able to find medical research that related to them. So a really like really vast and um, diverse range of stories were shared with us. Um, and so we took the archive of the stories and decided that it, it would be um, that you know there was sort of a lot of kind of insight and and a an emotion in that archive and so we wanted to find a way to share it so we um automatically generated a video for each of the stories um using some video editing tools that sam has developed um and we took a uh video content from tech advertising and using keywords in the stories matched video content with the with the imagery from these this advertising database, and so here are just a few of the video stories that that came about. Um, so stories about sexuality, Facebook advertising, seemingly knew I was queer before I had told anybody. So there were a number of these sorts of stories about um, coming out um, and 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 ads. Uh, here's another one. So I can basically use Instagram as a casual period tracker. I've been served pad and tampon ads a few days before my period for the last few months. So, you know, some things in life are fairly regular and, and uh, some, uh, some algorithmic systems are able to, to predict that. Here's another. So once uh, I got into a serious relationship, the ads I was targeted with drastically changed. So gone were the five tips to find sexy singles and now I've received five to 10 ads for pregnancy tests per day. And finally, just one more. 
Um, I rather resented that when I turned 60, my Facebook became peppered with adverts for incontinent pants. There is still life in this old dog yet, but I take care when I cough nowadays. Um, so definitely uh, targeting based on uh, age brackets. Um, so when we imagine what, what is creepy, uh, we think of unwanted attention via our bodily organs. We think of human ways of knowing, an eye watching, an ear listening, and by extension, a camera, a microphone. But now there are new organs for sense and perception. These are the phone, the browser, the data center, linear regression, neural networks. And as AI historian Stephanie Dick points out, unlike early AI research and AI technologies that were that really attempted to create computer systems to mimic human reasoning and deduction. So right, the AI of the 60s was about like mimicking and, and trying to reproduce the human. Contemporary machine learning is founded on processes that are outside of human cognitive capacities. So they're founded on difference from being human. These systems are not about building understanding or knowledge. They're about pattern recognition and predictions made from large accumulations of sometimes mundane and, and always messy data. Um, so, you know, this data comes from, you know, everything we do online. This is just a screenshot of the mouse clicks that Instagram tracks, uh, but it's also combined with offline data. Um, and so this is just a very, like, I'm gonna show this really quick clip of a very telling uh, interview uh, from some executives at uh, data brokerage companies. At Data Logics, we saw well, what people buy is a really interesting signal to look at, both to get your ads in front of the right people, but also to measure whether the ads are effective. And consumers do almost all their spending in the offline world. So that sounds like a really difficult challenge. How do we harness all this data from the offline world that resides in kind of legacy point of sale systems and connect it into the digital fabric? And so that's what we've spent the last six years doing. And at this point, we've aggregated over $2 trillion in consumer spending and integrated into digital media kind of wherever it flows. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I know at, at, at uh, Blue Kai and at the Oracle Data Cloud, we had a huge focus on understanding consumers based on you know what they did in digital, what they do on the websites, uh, what they do on mobile, intent, and so on. So coming together, what it means is the marketer will have a view of the consumer where they know what they do via websites and mobile, what they say via social, and what they buy, whether it's online or offline. So it's very powerful. So it's just really striking to me how explicit uh, this project has been in, in combining offline, online, and social graph data um, in order to uh, show us advertising and predict uh, what we will buy and what we might click on. Um, many, of course, many researchers and journalists, you know, I'm sure many of you have read things from Kathy O'Neill, Ruha Benjamin, Virginia Eubanks, who remind us about um, how machine learning methods used for justice, access to social services, or in the case of the new organs, the means by which people are shown content online, such as job ads or real estate listings. They, these, these researchers remind us how highly problematic uh, this is, given historic patterns of discrimination based on race, um, class and sex, um, you know, there's been a lot of amazing journalism in this space, too, around how, say, Facebook has been, you know, showing ads for, like, high-level executive jobs only to men because most men, uh, there's, a, there's more men in these positions than there are, there are women. And so these critiques are all really important. And, um, you know, we took a lot of the research we did around these systems and, and produced it into a video that's also available on the website. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out here that the response should not be to fix these systems or to make a fairer algorithm or to do the impossible and take bias out of data, but rather um, to look at whether these systems align with our values, our values of equity, transparent process of justice and so forth. And then if they don't, you know, fight against their very implementation. Um, so just to wrap up on this one, yeah, the, the, the archive is presented online. And um, I think the other point to make is the uh, really 
obvious information asymmetry that's at the heart of these machine learning systems where smaller actors do not have access to the vast data sets available to big tech companies um, and where the operations of these corporations are designed to be unknowable. So despite the fact that um, the, the knowledge that's created from them are about us, they're not for us. Right. So the question then kind of arises, right? How, how can we come to terms with the fact that um, everything that we do is tracked, exploited, mined, right? That all of our individual seemingly ephemeral traces are converted into structured data and stored in, per in perpetuity across the internet? How can we uh, come to terms with the idea that our human experiences are transformed into predictive models and into business models? And one, one response to this, it seems, um, is to attempt at all costs to invert this basic online power structure. Um, and to do this, you can exploit a fundamental contradiction of the internet. Uh, that the contradiction is that power also must leave traces online, right? Uh, and that through leaving traces, uh, certain truths, although you know maybe they're scattered and decentralized, they can become visible because they were always there hiding in plain sight. This is like the Strava user who tr unintentionally traces out uh, the paths of military bases while jogging, right? These mundane activities can coalesce to re reveal patterns, secrets, and hidden realities. And sometimes uh, these matter, and sometimes they don't. Uh, so we have been calling this inversion, uh, that of web scraping and data collection as an artistic or cultural practice, scrapism. Scrapism, defi uh, it combines data journalism, conceptual art, and archiving in some kind of attempt to extract data from behind all of these various web interfaces that mediate our lives, uh, to relocate those uh, uh, those data sets uh, and uh, to relocate them for emotional rather than analytic or instrumental ends. Uh, so the next two projects that we're going to show you, the next and the last two, um, deal with uh, uh, this practice of scrapism. Uh, and uh, the first is. Uh, the New York apartment. Um, uh, in this project, we downloaded every single for sale apartment listing in New York City and combined them together into this kind of like one uh, massive listing. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, I should skip that one actually. Um, and the idea here is to kind of like represent the totality of uh, New York real estate market uh, in a single web object, right? Uh, so you can kind of like get uh, all of housing as commodity, at least in New York, all of housing as commodity in a single glance. Um, so what makes up like a real estate listing? Uh, the first thing probably that comes to mind are facts and figures, right? Uh, the, the price, the square footage. In our case, uh, this New York apartment uh, that we're listing uh, cost $43 billion, $869,676,311, right? Uh, there's 65,000 bedrooms, 55,000 bathrooms, and 36 million uh, square feet. Um, uh, there's also a tremendous amount of language that goes into a real estate listing. So our project kind of collects and accumulates all of, uh, all of this language. And my slides got slightly out of out of order. These are all the adjectives and nouns. I'm just going to go back a second. Uh, these are um, all the questions from all the real estate ads in New York. So it's like, why pay for other people's taste? Why pay rent? Why pay rent when you can own this surprising, uh, surprisingly spacious two-bedroom condo? Why pay rent when you can own? Why pay rent? Why rent when you can buy? Why rent when you can own and build equity? Why rent when you can own for less in this investor-friendly building with very low maintenance? Why rent when you can own for less? Why rent when you can own uh, this all brick three bedroom house with a private backyard and so on and so on and so on. Just combines language, but then also um, images, of course, a big part of real estate listings. So one thing we did is we, we downloaded every single image and then we sorted them by room type. So you can kind of, you go through these almost infinite slideshows of like, you know, 20,000 images of bedrooms, right? Um, I'm gonna come back to that one in a second or uh, uh, 14,000 images of kitchens, uh, 70,000 images of bathrooms, 
uh, 20 or 2,000 images of gyms and so on and so on and so on. Um, and one of the things I think that becomes really interesting as you're going through um, an archive like this is you you get like uh, you really start to see the the texture uh, the texture of the archive in a way. So like a lot of the bedrooms right that you look at um, they're being posted by real estate companies and they've staged the apartments and like kind of bought new furniture, but also like a lot of the people selling uh, stuff on. Uh, you know, on on real estate uh, listings, they uh, they're just individuals, and they're not necessarily staged departments. So this is like a collection, for example, of all of you know, like a bunch of unmade beds. Right? I like this one at the bottom where it looks like there's someone in it. I think there might be <laughs> there might be someone in that. Bed. Yeah. Um, but so there's that, these two categories of images, right. right? Where one is like the staged real estate ideal, like yes. domestic bliss yes. home, and then yeah. there's these. Yeah, the, what our actual homes look like. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, uh, and then for, so right, so what else? So there's there's images, there's text, there's like the metadata, and then there's also like uh, tons of videos, right? So uh, one of the things we did is sort of compile a tremendous number of, a uh, tremendous amount of, of video content from New York uh, real estate listings, and then sort them in different ways. So here's an example. Master bedroom. 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 Um, and again, this was a very like, I guess like the thing with this project is that we, we had downloaded all of the data and then we just, we just wanted to keep making more and more sort of, sort of like things with it. So one of the things we did also is we, we got all of the, um, floor plans from all, not all, of, not all of the, not every single listing has a floor plan, but like many of them do. So we got all the floor plans and then we, uh, found a nice way to kind of figure out where the walls and uh, the windows and the doors are, and then we extruded them, and then we made a series of these uh, sort of architect ar architectural uh, formations uh, using the floor plans to kind of uh, create a, a space that you could explore. So we have one that's kind of like a maze, and then we have uh, one that's a pyramid, uh, and then a high rise, and then a tower. Um, and, uh, and of course, the other extremely important part of a real estate listing is the mortgage calculator. Uh, so it, here you can punch in your, um, your, uh, you know, your yearly salary, and then you can determine uh, what your monthly payment would be. Um, one of the things also that I really enjoy about this uh, mortgage calculator is that you know, it will tell you how much of the New York apartment you can afford based on the recommendation that you only spend 30% of your income <laughs> on housing costs. So I think this is for me and it's, Point zero 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 four seven uh, percent of the apartment I can I can afford that, um, and then we sort of conclude uh, the New York apartment with this uh, listing of uh, real estate agents, all the real estate agents. Um, in the initial version, the first draft of this project, we had built a system where you could um, you could text all of the real estate agents into like one huge uh, group chat, uh, but then we had to change it for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, yeah, and so that's 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 the New York apartment. Again, the idea here is like, you know, we're what if you could see the entirety of of this housing commodity um, uh, in a single glance? But I think I also like it because um, it imagines the entirety of New York City real estate as one space that we all get to collectively inhabit or right. that could be collectively available to all of us, right? right? So yeah, what is what would that world be? Right, so the idea is like here it is in its worst form, but also like perhaps there's a, the ability because it's all uh, collected together to imagine what it would look like in another uh, social and economic formation. Yeah, like a shared resource. Um, 
Okay, so Get Well Soon is the final piece we'll share today, um, which is very recent. Uh, we just published this like, when did we publish this? A couple months ago? No, no less. A month ago, maybe. What is time? I don't know. I've been in this apartment for like 40 days now. Yeah. Um, we were invited by a the curator Zhang Ga, who is um, working in Beijing. He's, he's from Beijing. Um, and he was putting together an online art exhibition in response to the COVID virus crisis as it was playing out in China at the time. So um, yeah, this was like in January, I think. And so throughout the process of putting this project together, this uh, the virus situation obviously became global and um, yeah, really started to unfold as we were producing, producing this work. Um, and here we here we all are. Um, so get well soon is is a response to to this moment that w that we're in, uh, and it takes the form of a sort of giant sympathy e card. Um, and the the project includes an archive of comments that have been scraped from the crowdfunding website called GoFundMe. And it also uh, includes a commissioned essay from writer um, Johanna Hedva. So I'm sure most of you know this, but just in case there are some sort of non-Americans in the audience, um, GoFundMe is a for-profit crowdfunding website launched in 2010, and it enables individuals to launch fundraisers for what the company calls, you know, life's important moments, but for what many have in fact described as life's desperate moments. Um, so, you know, you can launch campaigns in different categories. And of course, uh, in the US, over a third of the campaigns are in the category of health and medical expenses because of the cost of healthcare here. Uh, so to raise money, the site encourages people to tell their stories of their health and financial problems in order to try to elicit donations from their communities. And then when people make donations, you know, there are the, they, they typically leave an encouraging message or a comment or, or a dialogue unfolds publicly between uh, the, the donor and the, the receiver. Um, so like most online platforms, uh, there's no real easy way of scraping data from this website because obviously like data is this valuable thing for platforms such as these. Um, so it was quite difficult actually to get all of the the comments. Um, do you want to speak to, to that at all? Yeah, I mean, it was just sort of like, uh, uh, you know, in a way, something like GoFundMe, I mean, of course, the premise of the project is that it's an archive that shouldn't exist. But like, in a way, because it does exist. And, and you know, in a way, it's such a valuable um, source of information about uh, that the health uh, of of Americans, right? So I really it, it should in a way be be, be public, right? But it, but it isn't exactly. And so what we had to do is 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 use their um, uh, their built-in search engine to uh, to find the fundraisers. And to do this, we just compiled this huge list of of disease diseases disease names, and then would and then would search through all of these dis different disease names to get the URLs of uh, the different fundraisers and then from there to get um, the, the well-wishing comments that people uh, the people were leaving. Uh, so these are some of the comments. Um, all my best, all my best to you, all my best and get well soon, all my best and most positive wishes to you and your family, all my best blessing to you, all my best brother, all my best darling, all my best dear friend, all my best during the tragic time. All my best for health and happiness. All my best for a full and speedy recovery. I wish the best. I wish your mum and the family the best. I wish you all the best for the future. I wish you speedy recovery. I wish you a full recovery. I wish I had a way to help you more. Um, I wish they had a program to help pay for it. I wish they would find a cure for this disease. I wish things could have turned out differently for you. I wish things were very different for all of you right now. So, you know, these, this archive is full of generosity, of hope, of wishes for recovery, of sympathy, of fear, of love, but it's also an archive that longs for change. 
I wish things were different. I'm sorry that this system in this country makes it financially difficult. I wish we didn't have to deal with this system. I wish there was a national healthcare system so people wouldn't have to worry about seeking funding for health emergencies. Indeed, uh, most GoFundMe campaigns do not meet their funding goals. The people who do are likely to be affluent and well-connected. You have to have technology, technological literacy, health and medical literacy, media literacy, and a big community in order to make a successful campaign and tell a compelling story. Um, researchers, uh, Berliner and Kenworthy, who have studied GoFundMe, uh, go on to observe that the importance of certain literacies and forms of social capital on GoFundMe reproduce inequities and reinforce a hyper-individualized system of choosing who is and who is not deserving. Um, and so they really talk about GoFundMe uh, through what they call a politics of deservingness, where, campaigns, where campaigners are required to perform not only their pain and their suffering, but they're also required to demonstrate their moral integrity in order to appeal to donors. And, you know, we see this politics of deservingness play out right now today and obscure the need for universal access to healthcare, um, no matter who you are or what differences you might have. You know, and I think there's a lesson here that we can see in the history of technology, and that is that emerging technologies are so often promoted as being highly innovative, um, but are exact, uh, actually very conservative and more often than not reinforce the status quo. We see this in machine learning and we see this in uh, technology such as GoFundMe, which is, you know, a crowd sourced um, health funding platform that emerged after the last recession in an environment of austerity. And their claim to be changing the way the world gives actually, in actual fact, they reinforce an already wildly inequitable health system. Um, so to accompany this archive, we also commissioned um, an essay from Johanna Hedfer. She's a writer known for sick woman theory, um, which is theory that explores what modes of protest are available to those who are sick or not able-bodied. So this work uh, is more relevant than ever, and, and we really were so thrilled that with the piece that she contributed in response to the archive. Um, and so she's really asking, you know, what does protest look like? if maybe you can't use your body to disrupt production or to draw attention to injustices. So we're just gonna read a few sort of lengthy quotes from the essay, but I think uh, they, they, have a, they are really relevant in this current moment. So um, these are, these are from, the, from the essay. Uh, we tend to place illness and revolution opposite each other on the spectrum of action. Illness is on the end of inaction, passivity and surrender while revolution is on the end of movement, surging and agitating. Now might be a good time to rethink what a revolution can look like. Perhaps it doesn't look like a march of angry, able-bodied people in the, in the streets. Perhaps it looks like something more like the world standing still because all the bodies in it are exhausted, because care has to be prioritized before it's too late. The world isn't built to give carefully, freely, and abundantly. It's trying now, but look how alien a concept this is, how hard it is to make happen. It will take all of us, it will take all of us operating on the principle that if only some of us are well, none of us are. And that's exactly why it's revolutionary. Because care demands that we live as though we are all interconnected, which we are. It invalidates the myth of the individual's autonomy. In care, we know our limits because they are the places where we meet, where we meet each other. My, my limit is where you meet me, yours is where I find you. And at this meeting place, we are linked, made of the same stuff, transforming into one because of the other. Uh, and so in conclusion, you know, our, our lives continue to be augmented by apps, ever more websites, platforms, services that accumulate and build endless archives archives of trivia, archives of, you know, moments that had profound significance to us, um, messages, images, screenshots, code fragments, all of these continue to amass and threaten to overwhelm us. 
just as um, Krasinovsky's apartment dweller is subsumed by his ever-growing room. Uh, the projects we've shown today, you know, attempt to assemble, filter, and then represent, you know, small slices of this sea of data. Just like tech companies around us, um, we have tried to amass, you know, vast and revealing data sets, but rather than exploiting these for automation or prediction, we've tried to show them in ways where they can be seen all at once or where they can be navigated and experienced at multiple scales. So like, how does a small sweet note of sympathy scale up and show, show us something about, you know, the systems we're living with? Uh, how does a training data set feel? You know, what is the emotional resonance of an archive produced by, you know, a collective experience that we are all in together? Um, you know, I look at the Get Well Soon archives and I just, you know, feel so many moments of like warmth, but then also sadness all at the same time. You know, I wish these messages and this, this record did not exist and didn't need to exist. And I think, you know, that's sort of what we're, we're trying to do here. We're trying to attempt to locate ourselves uh, and reveal some of the truths and con contradictions of where we are now and figure out a way to find our way through. And that's it. So that's it. thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, very good. I'm going to stop sharing and just go to the video of us. This is great. Um, thank you so much, Sam and Tiga, for this talk that's obviously very timely and you know contemporaneous with the COVID pandemic, uh, being trapped inside of small spaces, uh, being in a society which is uh, intermittently and sporadically uh, and uh, you know, unwell, um, and the way that we are all, all interconnected together. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to uh, just to say, uh, first of all, for those of you asking online, this talk is recorded. And secondly, um, I think we can have like maybe five or 10 minutes of Q&A right now. Um, if you're in the YouTube, uh, there's a chat space. I've already jotted down a few questions. I'm going to try and keep an eye uh, on the other laptop there to kind of keep to follow along with those. And um, uh, I thought I'd ask you folks a couple questions while, while, while you're here, Sam and Tiga. Um, uh, so actually, I was just to say that when you said this archive should not exist, I was really reminded of Mimi Onuoha's work because uh, it's kind of the opposite, um, which is, uh, uh, and so I wonder if you could just, just to throw you a curveball for a second, if you talk about the duality of uh, saying that this, that this archive should not exist and where, uh, where she, other, she also says, you know, these archives really ought to exist. Um, uh, it's funny what we track and what we don't. Mm -hmm. And also what can be extracted. You have any any thoughts about about um, what we see or what we don't see? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, like both perspectives sort of sit alongside each other, right? I think um, the you know Mimi's work has been so inspirational for I think both of us for really like highlighting the politics of of data collection and how that then flows on to the way that resources are distributed and, and the way that um, inequities get reinforced. Uh, I just saw something tweeted the other day. Did you see this maybe yesterday about um, the data that Amazon has about its employees? Um, and so this fellow from Amazon was asked, do you have any data about how many Amazon employees uh, have COVID? And he's like, no, I just I have no idea how many of them have COVID. And like this, and someone pointed out that like this was Amazon talking, which is one of the most highly instrumented uh, companies, corporations for, for monitoring people. And at the same time, someone within Amazon had leaked this private dashboard that they have, which indicates for every Amazon uh, sort of facility in the United States, the likelihood measured in like 10 different dimensions of whether or not they're going to unionize. Yeah, um, I saw that unionization dashboard thing. It was so, in just insane and awful uh and so clearly they're trapped they you know this database should not exist and this database should right yeah well they're flips i mean they're, they're on the same you know uh flips uh the same the different sides of the same coin you know so yeah. i think i think you know um i but i mean i think the data sets we're often working with are sort of incidental in that um you know the gofundme comments are not sort of considered a database that's really being 
uh, you know, studied for like insight, right, or to automate something or to ins be instrumentalized in some ways. So and this is this notion of, of, uh, of data scraping as a mode of artistic practice where you're you're applying a sieve or a filter to the world um, uh, to ask questions of the world and extract data sets from the world that are latent but have never actually been captured before. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's the the question with a lot of work like this is like what what um are you are you going to try to capture right and how are you going to navigate that material in a way um that does it justice and isn't for and isn't doesn't continue to to like exploit uh exploit people right which is always a question which are, which we always ask ourselves and hopefully we hopefully we do it of course if we you know we're also open to criticism if, if we have it you know is there an ethics to data aggregation of the kind that you're doing in your scrapism uh, where suddenly you're able to kind of find, you know, people to punch down on, I mean, if you will, right? right? But it's, 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 it's that you're able to suddenly identify um, uh, vulnerabilities in the system by scraping for them in ways that maybe people who, who were otherwise anonymous would be suddenly, somehow suddenly vulnerable. Um, yeah, I mean, we obviously like we that's a big issue is right how do you um produce work that's aligned with your values and that isn't going to punch down um that isn't going to compromise people i mean you know i even uh, and like we i think we often have mixed feelings about like working with data in this way because it's very hard to sometimes avoid um, these moments, like, you know, the Enron data set is full of people who are still around working in the energy sector, you know, and we sort of casually talk about this data set as this cultural object, I think, very easily. It's very easy to do that. Um, so this is, you know, this is a conversation that is very much alive in our practice, and it's very much something we consider in every single project. There's a couple of questions coming from the chat. I just want to kind of uh, bubble them up to you. Um, uh, one person asked, uh, could things like the Enron project become common as people want to relive mundane experiences that they've missed? Uh, not just uh, emails, you know, uh, but maybe a Twitter feed from a certain era, you know, uh, yeah. this, well, this I mean, nostalgia, like Tristan I think, Shandy. I, th I think so. I mean, it's like, it's an incredible uh, thing to look, you know, we, we look at it as like a reenactment, right? And and what what's so fascinating about about when you actually are you know signing up for that project and experiencing it, is that it's really it can be very difficult to understand what um, what is your life and what is is like Enron. Mm. You know, so like why didn't you come to the meeting today? And you're like, oh God, I didn't I didn't come to the meeting. And you you know? scroll down to the end of the email and like, oh my God, it happened in 1999. It's okay. It's all right, you know. But there's something like both like. Like I kind of think of it as like this, like a weird, as a kind of like a weird augmented reality project in a way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it like overlays this other time time frame and these these other personalities onto your like very personal, you know, this very personal thing, which is your which is your email, um, obviously personal and professional. Uh, I do think like I could really sort of imagine these other kinds of. Um, like attempts to do sort of similar things uh, with other email data sets or with or with your own data. Uh, if but of course it would be like you know it would be maybe like uh, painful in a way too. So I don't know. I mean, I th it could be, it, or, but also therapeutic. So I, I think it has a lot of yeah. I I would love to see other projects in that in this vein. You know, um, there's maybe. Uh... Um, a couple more questions I want to ask, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up by six o'clock uh, here on the East Coast. Um, so one question is, uh, how do you feel about initiatives to diversify data? Uh, and the example that they give is IBM's Diversity in Faces project. And you know the, the, the logic here being there are some very well-founded complaints that you know um, these data sets you know don't see certain kinds of people because they've only been because of inbuilt biases they've only been trained on you know white men or something like this uh and there's a kind of a flip side right which, which says like well i don't know if i want to be surveilled more accurately and and with greater reliability by the the machine by the state um do you have any comments on that i mean i think um the critique 
of those systems based on their sort of current like flaws or failings uh, is dangerous because it sort of distracts from the question of whether we should be using facial recognition at all, where is it appropriate to use it and where is it not. Um, I think if we only launch criticisms based on the current failure, like technical failures of these systems, I mean, that's a race that, you know, the tech companies are always going to win, right? Because yes, they can make the data more diverse. They can like tweak the ad targeted advertising so that it's more accurate. But the question is, do we want these systems in our lives? Do we want them underlying, you know, just, just our justice systems, our policing systems at all? And I, yeah. I think it's a really interesting question for like designers and engineers in particular of what does like design and engineering look like to choose not to do something or like to refuse something or to choose not to engineer at all. Like I'm really fascinated with technologists who just decide to like quit their fields that they've been working in for like 20 years because of an ethical like problem. But I also think it's a really similar question to like the, the, to the question of, oh, should we try to improve the private healthcare system we have, right? And, fix, and try to patch it up or should we just throw it away and, and do something much better. And I think, I, you know, the answer for, for me, of course, is like, yeah, you should throw it away, right? So there's a, there's, should, there's a question here, which is, there's a question which is, which is really specific to your work, which is, you know, could you talk for a moment about where you've had to make an ethical decision in uh, projects that you are making? I mean, you, you mentioned one where you said, well, okay, we, we decided not to simultaneously text 8,000 realtors. Um, but, but maybe uh, uh, other examples of this where you're, you're making ethical decisions and maybe even cases where the two of you are, are perhaps arguing uh, about it. what sorts of, what sorts of, because as collaborators, what sorts of, of arguments have you had about how to make the work and how it should be positioned or, or what, where the ethics lie for you? We've never argued. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, I mean, I think we didn't talk about this project, but one of the earliest collaborations we did was that smell dating work, which was a dating service based on smell. And I'll check it out. And because <laughs> it was the real participatory thing, um, you know, and we were building a, like online website that would connect people based on, you know, how they ranked the samples of other people's t-shirts that they were sent. We had the opportunity to like collect a whole bunch of data about people like any dating service would, right? Like demographic information or like record people's emails or chats or whatever. And we really just deliberately decided to collect none of it um, to try again, just to try to build a system that like reflects our own values. And I think it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's problematic to try to critique systems that with uh by then reenacting like the same problems that they're built with or um i don't know if we've had disputes though really. about the ethics of it i don't know yeah i mean the problem actually is that we agree too much yeah probably <laughs> and then we need somebody to be like actually that's a bad idea you know but um I mean, I think, you know, th I, I do think like a, a good rule of thumb is like, you know, I mean, it's it's like cliche to say at this point, but just to, to try to punch up instead of punching down. Yeah, and so I think, you know, we also always talk about like, if the work is participatory, you know, like the, the person participating in it, or if you were the participant in it, it should be a good experience for you. Like you should come away feeling like happy and excited to have been a part of it. And if, and if there's a sort of situation where the, you know, the participant was feeling like something was surprising or like, yeah, their trust was broken in some way, then like, that's just not a practice that I'm you know, personally interested in. And, and have, has anyone from whom you scraped data come back around to you and said, hey, you scraped that data? Did GoFundMe say to you, you know, hey, uh, that project you made, you know, I'm not sure I feel so good about that. Uh, well, you can, you get well soon, you know? Do they have we, we did a project, the very first project that Tegan and I did together was called the Intergovernmental Panel on Capitalism. And it was like a find and replace project where we went through every single like, document, image, video, t like text, website that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made. And we replaced the word with the phrase climate change with the word capitalism and like made a whole web, you know, it was like the whole, it was like really like this very like, you know, one line joke that we that we took to an extreme level and they they did 
they 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 did threaten to sue us. Yes, they were not happy about that about it's that the project. The UN, like yeah, the, it's not an individual. The toothless UN threatened, <laughs> but but um, they're powerful people. Like yeah. I'm not worried about um, yeah offending them. I mean, I think an interesting mm -hmm. example is like so with the New Organs project. We didn't really know what we were doing when we started like soliciting stories through the survey and so forth. And we didn't um, ask people if we could make the stories they shared with us public. And then halfway along, we were like, oh, these stories are really interesting. And, you know, they're showing us a lot about how people are experiencing platforms. And wouldn't it be great to like make this a public archive? But like we hadn't got permission when people were sharing this information with us. So we had to go back, like, so we obviously felt like it wasn't appropriate to like make public these stories that had been shared in a sort of ambiguous like survey form. Mm -hmm. And so we then, you know, had to go back and like reapproach everyone and get their consent. And so of course half the people didn't reply and like it did feel like a very kind of messy thing because we, yeah, the project sort of emerged as we went along. And so in that case, yeah, like we sort of, didn't we weren't able to publish just a great majority of what we had because you know we felt like it was inappropriate and i think there's a there's a way in which um scraping and scrapism can uh, on the one hand uh, allow you to be a mouthpiece for people who can't punch up right you're you can be a kind of a vessel or a conduit for communicating things on the other hand um there's a way in which if you're if you're taking people's voices, there's a kind of exploitation there. There's a comment in the chat that um, you know, taking people's comments from GoFundMe, um, maybe that's exploitative, right? And I think there's a flip side that says, um, you know, well, it's anonymized for one thing, right? You, you haven't like put a link to the specific GoFundMe's where someone said, "I'm so sorry about your specific disease" or whatever it is. Um, do you do you think that? To what to what extent you know zero to hundred is I mean is is that is that a kind of exploitation and is acting as a conduit for those sentiments kind of enough to justify their use as found text to kind of you know distill a zeitgeist? Yeah, I mean this is the this is the question, isn't it? Like, um, you know, this is the question that is the question of machine learning, where most training data sets have come from scraping Flickr or scraping Facebook or scraping for like in a non-consensual uh, forum. Um, and I would say that um, it's, I don't know, mm. honestly, like, um, I feel like the presentation of the archive plays a lot into that, right? Where you know, we tried to really uh, break sentences apart so that they're just sort of short phrases. Um, they're not attributed to anyone. They're sort of sorted by the first few words of the sentence. So you sort of get just a feeling of the quantity rather than a specificity that could be associated with any particular place or individual. Like they're really decontextualized and I think that's important and I don't think I would feel comfortable with it otherwise. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, you are taking these very, very short snippets. One person comments, well, you know, not providing a link is is a, only a minor dodge when there's full text search. But it, it occurs to me actually something else, which is which is about the, the GoFundMe project, is that um, in five years or 10 years, we can we can be virtually guaranteed all of those, those GoFundMe's will be evaporated off the internet. Uh, and yet maybe the archive will remain in its anonymized kind of state to preserve something about this moment and about what it was like to live in America without, without healthcare. Well, I mean, I think that's for us like a big, a big point of some of these these projects is that like, the, they're not just for the present, but they're for the they're for the future. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a difficult, it's a it's a difficult archive, and and you know the. It's it's always very tricky when you're trying to sort of express yourself through someone else's words. Right. Um, but I think that ultimately it's a worthwhile archive to have. Um, like a, it's like a worthwhile piece piece of history to have. Um, 
and and of course like yeah like that those those critiques are very valid and um uh they're yeah they're really valid really valid critiques i'm gonna wrap um i want to thank you both so much uh tiga brain and sam levine uh if you are just coming in sort of tuning into their work for the first time i highly recommend you check out their their projects both individually and uh, together uh they've done works in speculative virtual reality they've done work in uh um, uh, contestational hydroponics. Um, they <laughs> have a really diverse practice across engineering and data sciences um, and uh, visual art. Uh, and with that, I want to say uh, thank you both very much. And if you're, um, uh, if you would uh, subscribe to us over at the um, uh, Studio for Creative Inquiry over at Carnegie Mellon, uh, the Frank Ratchie Studio uh, is your stop for atypical and antidisciplinary uh, art science research um, and outreach. Uh, we'll be having more programs like this uh, as part of our Steiner Lecture Series, and uh, please stay tuned for more. Teague and Sam, thank you so much for today. Thanks for having us, Colin. You bet. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks.